Chante, chante fort ce chant de liberté. Chante, chante fort pour la liberté. Chante, chante fort ce chant de liberté. Chante, chante fort pour la liberté. Chante pour la liberté. Chante pour la liberté. Chante pour la paix pour tout le monde. Chante pour la paix pour tout le monde. In bene vote un saluto mo già amani, 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 umo già. Amani, 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 umo già. Chante, chante fort ce chant de liberté. Chante, chante fort pour la liberté. Chante, chante fort ce chant de liberté. Chante, chante fort pour la liberté. Chante pour la liberté. Chante pour la liberté. Chante pour la paix pour tout le monde. Chante pour la paix pour tout le monde. In bene vote un saluto mo già amani, 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 umo già. Amani, 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 umo già. Chante, chante fort ce chant de liberté. Chante, chante fort pour la liberté. Thanks so much, uh, Sylvia McNair and Gary Walters accompanying her. Welcome to all of you uh, here this evening, and thank you for coming to our uh, fourth annual, or is it third annual? Fourth or third annual Tusker Tales. It was started by uh, a group of uh, IU medical students way back uh, four years ago. So uh, my name is Bob Einters, and I am the director of the Center for Global Health. Any previous uh, storytellers here? Uh, we just, please stand up. I know there are at least a, a couple of you here. There's one. They're brave souls, and you can see they actually, for those of you who are giving stories uh, tonight, they survived. Uh, they, they did okay. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank a few groups and individuals. Uh, WFYI uh, is a co-sponsor for this event and will be adapting Tusker Tale stories for uh, WFYI Radio. A special thanks especially to uh, Kent Vernon, and to Sean Jackson. Uh, they're from the utility room. They're over there. He's got a thing on his ear. So uh, if you're looking for a recording studio, uh, please look up uh, Kent Vernon. I, and uh, thanks as well to Clint McCollum, who's uh, donating his time to take photography. Uh, in fact, maybe right here. So thank you, Clint. Get a picture of someone other than me. Uh, and then uh, in front, when you registered, uh, there were uh, several of, uh, of the medical students, including uh, former Slamenda scholars, Madeline Vonderhoe and Ryan Smith. Uh, so thank you to you if you're here in the room. There you are, way back standing against the wall. Thanks so much. And uh, to all of you who have supported our research care and uh, training mission in Kenya and uh, AMPATH, uh, thank you for making all of that possible. If you're on social media tonight, uh, please uh, use the hashtag Tusker Tales and tag us at AMPATH Kenya. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Sylvia McNair again. Uh, she'll be our MC tonight. I think most of you know Sylvia, two-time Grammy Award winner. She's been a terrific supporter of our program in Kenya, has been there on uh, multiple occasions, and uh, just a, a terrific person, a terrific friend, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Karibu! Karibu Risana! I'm so happy to see all of you here. It's a great, great pleasure for me to be part of the Ampath family. And we have some wonderful stories tonight, so let's get started. Our first storyteller is Grant Callan. He's a third-year medical student at IU, traveled to Kenya during the summer of 2017 as a Slamenda scholar. Grant is a native Hoosier, and prior to med school, 
spent a year in Tanzania, or Tanzania, as the Kenyans call it, working in a local HIV clinic and completing his capstone project in Swahili. Very impressive, Grant. His story is called Ambulances Without Nurses. Please welcome Grant Callen. The first year of medical school is really a glorified undergraduate experience. Not to say that it's easy by any means, but just that it was a lot more books and fewer people than I had anticipated. So when I was chosen to be a Slamenda scholar, I was ecstatic. See, this program allows first year students the opportunity to explore AMPATH firsthand, to contribute to its ongoing work in Eldoret, and to come back and tell our stories, just like this one. Shout out to my fellow Slamenda scholars, Roshni Dhut and Helen Lee. See, in Kenya, we did everything together. We took vitals on the wards, we attended morning rounds, we even started a movie night at the children's hospital. And as part of that exposure, we went with Dr. Sonak Pistakia to visit his community-centered care model called Big Pick, bridging income generation with group integrated care. Now, community-centered can include a lot of different things, but it almost always encompasses two, a tightly packed car and a long, bumpy road. And I can remember us driving through miles of green farmland before we finally got to Sunoco. And of course, we were a little late. And the group that had come to meet us was already assembled in these faded plastic lawn chairs, arranged in a semicircle, and all 65 plus, well-dressed, very amused by us fumbling with the automated blood pressure cuffs. Most of them were hypertensive, as expected, but within their own range of normal. So we gave them their medications and talked about life or our studies, what have you. And then we met Yukabeth. She was this elderly woman whose daughter's passing had caused her to miss her medication for the last eight months. She had only come that day because she'd been suffering this severe headache all morning long. And we knew she was going to be hypertensive, her blood pressure was going to be elevated, but when an automated cuff reads error over and over again, you know you can't just give that person a refill and send them home. So painstakingly, we convinced Yuka Beth to come back to Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital with us. And I remember at that point feeling relieved, like somehow everything was gonna be fine because we were going to a hospital. But we were an hour from home and our friend wasn't doing so well. She would take these rapid, shallow breaths and then push on her chest. Maybe it was anxiety, a combination of hers and ours, but things felt like they were going from urgent to emergent. And I could see it on Helen and Roshni's faces too. Here we sat holding this woman's hand or trying to offer water to be comforting without overbearing because that's all we really knew how to do. And then I remember feeling very grateful that a Kenyan speeding limit is more of a suggestion than anything else. Because we're flying down the highway and I have this list of words in my head like diaphoresis and dyspnea, words I had been taught to explain what was going on, but thankfully someone a little more proactive than me called for an ambulance. And help was on its way. But then Sonak asked, could we give her naproxen instead of aspirin in case she was having a heart attack? And we did not know the answer. I know the answer now, just in case you're worried. <laughs> but of course, all anyone had was naproxen. And so now we're racing to turbo to find aspirin. And we get there and the doors fly open the van and Sonak literally bounds over a wall into the pharmacy. And that was it. An hour's worth of panic and worry and reckless driving for one tiny chewable tablet. And again, I felt relieved. Yukabeth had the right medication. We were in even closer to home and help was still on its way. Things felt better. And I kid you not, right then it started to rain. This like heavy late in the day thunderstorm that just popped up out of nowhere and with it, so did our ambulance. They met us in a patrol station under some awning. I remember using my hands to cover Yukabeth's head from the rain and from the roof. Up into the ambulance she went and then she was gone. And our van felt so empty without her. But all I could think about was following up. What happens next? Who do I even talk to to find her? And as it turned out, 
none of that mattered. See, while we were deep in the hills of Sunoco, a nationwide nurses strike had begun. 27,000 nurses walked out across the country and didn't return for another five months. Meanwhile, we had rushed Yukabeth urgently to MTRH just for her to sit there and wait for someone to admit her. And it was 24 hours before we finally found her hungry and confused, but very happy to see familiar faces. I remember squatting beside her wheelchair and holding her hand, trying to reassure her while Sonak went to find someone who could run this test that we wanted. And before I knew it, he had wheeled her away. And that was that. That was Yuka Beth's story. Well, that's my story about her, more accurately. And telling it now, I'm shocked by all of the times that I felt relief, like the story's ending would be happy. See, I think in medical school, I had read so many books and just shadowed, and I hadn't learned how to be an amateur EMT. There was no course on how to fix the middle seat in your van when it gets stuck. But despite overcoming those obstacles, things still didn't work out the way that I had expected. See, as med students, we're taught that knowledge is power. And we think that if we have all the right answers, we'll pass the tests, and that's medicine. But the truth is that medical knowledge is really the last step in healthcare delivery. And in fact, when I think about it now, it's sort of the last thing that I had with me at the time. See, instead of knowing everything that there was to know about medicine, I needed to understand the system within which I was working. And I needed to know how to help those who didn't to navigate it successfully. Whether we're in Indiana or all the way in Eldoret, we need to advocate for our patients, for our colleagues, and for change when our systems are flawed. After all, what good are ambulances without nurses? Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Grant. Our next storyteller is Serbi Dosi. Serbi is an engineering team leader at Eli Lilly and Company. She grew up in Atlanta, my old hometown, where she studied mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. She visited Eldoret, Kenya in March of 2018 as part of Lilly's Connecting Hearts Abroad volunteer program where she partnered with Kenyan counterparts to organize a World Cancer Day marathon and fundraiser. Her story is called, Your Friends Are Waiting For You. Please welcome Serbi Dosi. Hi everyone, can you hear me? So thank you, Sylvia. As, as Sylvia mentioned, I'm Serbi Dosi, and I want to thank you all for being here tonight to listen to all of our stories. My, my experience in Kenya was absolutely incredible. I have never felt so inspired and motivated, so I'm here tonight to share some of those stories with you. The, these stories are about three amazing people I met, and hopefully you feel inspired as well. So my first story is about a woman named Mercy. Mercy is an empath worker whose responsibility is to educate women in remote villages about cervical and breast cancer. The team tagged along on one of her trips she had planned with the village chief who had agreed a rare meeting to set up a town hall meeting for us. Um, so <laughs> let me explain to you how a town hall meeting in Turbo works. So we arrived. Um, so the village chief texts his three junior chiefs about a time and location to meet. And then those junior chiefs text their leaders about the same time and location to meet. And within 30 minutes, you have 100 people show up in someone's front yard. And it's incredible. So on a bright sunny day in Turbo, in someone's front yard under some very large mango trees, we watched Mercy work. She effortlessly, effortlessly grabs the attention of the crowd, addresses the women, and teaches them about cancer, the importance of cancer screening, 
and dispelling any myths that they have heard along the way. The woman sitting on the ground, shifting to follow the shadow of, as the sun sets, feeling safe and empowered to take action about their own health. They were so empowered that they requested Mercy to set up screenings in their village for the following week. This was remarkable. We're talking about women who have probably never been to a doctor and know nothing about cancer who are finally taking care, control about their health. I was in awe. Mercy single-handedly changes hundreds of lives every day. Next, I want to talk about Elizabeth. She is also an empath worker who had invited us to attend one of her HIV support group meetings that she leaves in Bungoma County. We did not expect what, as we arrived, what we expected. So when we arrived, we had about eight women who greeted us and uh, welcomed them into their, into their meeting room, which is an eight by six foot container, shipping container. So we walk into this room. There's four of us from Lily, and along with Mercy and Elizabeth, we come into the shipping container, and all of a sudden, it's, they burst out to singing and then dancing, and we joined along. And it was great. I had never been in a shipping container, yet alone, but so much joy. <laughs> but also in that same container, we learned that Elizabeth herself had lived with HIV for the last 20 years. And she shared the challenges she faced in the community and how she overcame them. She has three beautiful children who were born with HIV negative and are the motivation for all the work she does today. So next, we moved outside where they had set up some plastic chairs, probably the same faded plastic chairs, uh, in front of the container where we sat facing a group of 25 women who called themselves Wasupu, which means the beautiful ones. This was just one of the 30 women HIV, HIV support groups that Elizabeth facilitated in Bungoma County area. So each one of the women stood up, introduced themselves, and shared their stories and journeys of living with HIV. It ranged from how they had been affected, the current viral load, and all these women shared a very intimate part of themselves. With us, who they had just met, so their openness, their acceptance of us into their support group, and their willingness to share this story had me in awe. I reflected upon this phenomenon. Yes, I call it that because I don't think I could ever share such an intimate detail like that so easily with friends, yet alone a group of strangers. Could you? So, now, so let me go back to the first day when I had met David for the first time. David was a driver that had picked me up from the Eldora Airport and drove me to the IU house. After the few friendly exchanges, I expressed to him that it was my first time in Kenya, and I didn't know anyone here. David very casually turns towards me and goes, don't worry, your friends are waiting for you. And I was, at first I thought, I was like, he met the Lily team at the IU house. And I didn't really understand that since I had not met from the Lily team. And I just told, I knew no one. I didn't understand what he really meant in that moment. And it was not later until I had gone through the experiences I just shared. It is so beautiful in its simplicity that anywhere you go in life, whether you know it or not, the destination will be full of potential friends, supporters, and a world of possibilities. As I reflected on this trip, that first interaction on the first day brought it home for me that one person can change lives. With that sentence, he changed my perspective and approach in my life. So before going on this trip to Kenya, I had always thought in the back of my mind where I wondered, how can I help? The two weeks in Kenya made me realize that it's not about me where I framed the question, how can I help? It made me realize that I was asking the wrong question the whole time. It's about where can I help? Maybe most of you have had the same thought as me, and that's why I'm up here to share my story and say, you all can help. All you have to do is show up. It's, it is simply that easy. If you've ever had the same question as I had, you're not alone. You've already taken that mental step to want to help, and the second step is just to show up, meet your new friends, and change the world. 
I will leave you all today with a few snippets of my experience in Kenya, the one that I will remember for the rest of my life. I take with me a newfound passion for change and a number of inspiring no role models and leaders who I plan to continue to work with the best I can. Please do not forget to pursue your passions with every bit of conviction like Mercy and Elizabeth. And I know that wherever you go, your friends are waiting for you. Great, Serby, thank you. Nate Miller is a commercial unit leader for Corteva AgriScience, the agriculture division of Dow DuPont, where he's held several roles over the past 23 years. He first traveled to Kenya with the Dow Ampath Partnership in 2012. His story is called Passion, Humility, and Corn. Please welcome Nate Miller. Those two stories are going to be hard to follow. Great, great stories. My story starts in 2011. In 2011, I had a coworker who had a very simple vision. His vision was, could we do more than simply discover great products and meet our profit objectives as a for-profit company? As we were involved in agriculture directly, could we not give back to our world in a small way by helping to alleviate the global hunger issue that was ever present in today's world. And with agriculture fundamentally all about food production, we've done a great job in developing ag technology to feed this growing planet. Yet various studies, various reports would continue to show that globally, one in five people in this planet continue to suffer issues with food insecurity and more distressing, one in 10 are chronically undernourished. So myself and a small group of others within, at that time, Dow AgroSciences formed around this vision to consider both some local as well as some global opportunities for us to give back to this world and help fight the global uh, food insecurity issues that we knew were all around us. So what we had was this passion and a loose vision. What we didn't have was any funding. So we realized that we were going to need some great partners along the way to bring this vision to reality. So in early 2012, I had the pleasure to meet Dr. Bob Einters for the first time. And Bob joined us on our campus to talk about what they were doing with Ampath. Bob described the Ampath journey starting in the late 80s and up to that point in early 2012 as the mission focus on medical teaching, local health care, it was an inspiring story, it was an inspiring message. And as Bob described their mission, he also described a primary issue, which was malnutrition with the local population. So he also described that most of the local population were farmers, and these were smallholder farmers, often farming an acre or two. So immediately as someone that grew up on a farm and farms today in central Indiana, I thought, shouldn't farmers be the best fed in the population, shouldn't they be able to feed their family thanks to their farming efforts? Couldn't they raise enough food? As we began exploring further, Bob made it very clear that they did not know agriculture. Agriculture was not Ampath's core focus. But what Ampath did have, along with a great vision and a tremendous connection with the local population, was a measure of humility. And this measure of humility combined with a passion said they can do more for Western Kenya and we can do more also. So in later 2012, I made my first trip to Kenya along with a couple other coworkers. We were extremely enthused, not just to the possibilities we had for direct employee engagement with the local population who were farmers farming these one and two acre plots, but this opportunity to engage further with the culture of Ampath. The culture of Ampath with this can-do spirit and this, this spirit of humility matched with this optimism really developed and led by Dr. Joe Mamlin 
was something that was terribly enthusiastic for us and encouraging. So we came home and said, we think we can do more here. We think we can do more to help the local population feed their children and earn enough to pay tuition to send them to school, just like any other parent in this world. Also, the favored crop in the area was corn. And in fact, we knew something about growing corn, both ourselves directly as well as our company. The challenge, however, wasn't our knowledge of how to grow corn but how to take our knowledge and implement with the local population. How do we meet the Kenyans where they are? And this was our challenge as we looked ahead. So back home after some grinding internal bureaucracy, questions such as, you wanna send someone where to do what and we continue to pay them while they're gone? Yes, we do. We persevered. I persevered, the team persevered, and we sent our first employee, Laron Beamer, in May of 2014. Admittedly, I had some trepidation. How will this work? Will Laron be safe? What can he really accomplish there? How do we engage with the local population? To our and Laron's direct benefit, Ampath had a, a, a subgroup within the organization called the Safety Net. And the safety net had been working directly with the local population, most of them farmers, and helping to form farm groups to help disseminate knowledge and discuss ways that they could improve their output and better feed their families. So Laron and now four subsequent employees after him have jumped in with gusto. We've connected with these farm groups and directly with the local farm population, helping them on basics such as agronomics, on fertility, seed selection, grain storage, grain marketing, and many other topics. I'm proud to say we've helped make a difference in this effort. These farm groups are comprised of motivated entrepreneurs who want to feed their family and send their children to school. With the right tools and the right information, we have seen them make progress. The simple part is telling the farmers what to do. The challenging part is bringing it to reality for them on their farms. We've been accomplishing that via demonstration plots and these improved techniques directly on their farms. So just to wrap up with a story of an impacted individual, Peter Mayunga was a farmer farming one acre of land. He had 10 children. He was struggling to feed his family and the opportunity to send his children to school was just a dream. In 2015, he met with the local Ampath agribusiness group and they helped him with some improved seed selection, some fertility and pest control. Now, Peter was harvesting on this one acre of land about 800 kilos of corn. This was not enough to feed his family. In the first year in 2015, with the improved techniques, he was able to improve his yield to 2,500 kilos on this one acre of land. And in 2016, with more work, 3,200 kilos on this one acre of land. And we're extremely pleased to report, Peter as one example here, has now been able to feed his family, send his children to school, and he has a daughter approaching graduation. It, it, it's tremendous to see, and, and thank you for your enthusiasm, it's tremendous for me to see that these resource-deprived farmers with a small boost in terms of enhanced capacity and technology can truly improve their lives and their families' lives. And so I'm also proud that our new company as we've gone through a corporate merger, now Corteva AgriScience, has dedicated itself again to this effort and we will continue sending employees to Eldoret, Kenya to assist in these efforts. And I'm excited with the future and the possibilities of what we can accomplish in helping those in, uh, in Western Kenya improve their and their families' lives. Thank you. Nate, I am so grateful you persevered through the layers of bureaucracy. Thank you so much for that. Janet Chepchumba. <laughs> recently arrived to Indianapolis from Eldoret, Kenya, and is a fourth year medical student 
at Moy University School of Medicine. She's here for a six-week rotation at Eskenazi Hospital. For more than 28 years, 28 years, IU and Moy University have partnered in this bilateral exchange. Her story is called My Journey in Medicine. Please welcome Janet Chepchumba. Thank you, Sylvia. I've never spoken in front of many Mzungus as I am today. For those who don't know, Mzungu is a Swahili word for white person. So if I start stammering, you'll understand why. So my story is titled My Journey in Medicine. I'd like to start with the motivation behind me wanting to become a doctor. So when I was eight years old, I got peptic ulcer disease. It's a disease in which you have erosion of your stomach or your intestines. So you end up presenting with symptoms like stomach pain, nausea, or vomiting. So I had these symptoms for a while, and it was not diagnosed that I had peptic ulcer disease because I had gone to a couple of public hospitals. And in Kenya, we don't have very developed equipment like you have here. So it took time before I was diagnosed. So my parents were finally referred to a pediatrician. It was a female doctor in Kenya at the time. There are not many female doctors. So she was very encouraging to my parents, telling me that this is something that normally happens and it's something that it can be healed. So from her, I derived a lot of motivation. I wanted to become a female doctor in a country where not many people have embraced education to female and profession like doctors in Kenya. So, so she, I don't remember her name, but she was a good doctor that I remember. <laughs> so anyway, she gave me good treatment and eventually I was healed after about five years. It took time, some time before I got better. And when I was 13 years old again, I got resistant malaria. You guys don't have a lot of malaria here. So for those who don't know about malaria, it's an infectious disease in Kenya, not in Kenya, mostly in Africa, caused by mosquitoes. So when it bites you, you get malaria. So if you have resistant malaria, You've, given, you've been given drugs, but the drugs are not effective, so you continue having the symptoms for malaria. So you normally have headaches, fever, chills, those kinds of things. So I got resistant malaria, and the drugs that I was given were not effective. So I had to be given something else, and I was given quinine. I think you guys say quinine. <laughs> yeah, so I was given that after being admitted. So I was in the hospital for about a week. And after the quinine, I got better. So from the two illnesses that I had and from the doctor who treated me, being a lady in a country where not many people have embraced education, I decided that I wanted to venture into medicine. So I got into high school in... 2009, and I went to a mixed high school in Kenya. Most of the high schools are single-sex high schools. So I went to a mixed high school. And if you're a girl in Kenya in a mixed high school, you need to work twice as much as the boys work because they always have this notion that they are better than the girls, especially in math and sciences. So, yeah, we used to wake up early, sleep late. Yeah, you do what you have to do depending on the circumstance. So we worked really hard, and I thank God because I was able to get good grades, and I was able to qualify for medical school. So I joined medical school in 2013, that's five years ago. First year of medical school is tough. Everyone here who has been to medical school can attest to that. So it's really tough, by the way. There's a lot of reading required. There's a lot of new vocabulary. 
you there's a lot of time required and you end up not having much of your social life as you do in school but at some point we got used to everything and we actually enjoyed life in medical school so the journey was okay until one and a half years ago some of you might have heard that we've had a couple of strikes in Kenya i think the first speaker talked about the nurses strike which was there for about four months. So there are no patients for us to take care of. There have also been two doctor strike, which lasted four months each. And there, has been two, there have been two lecturer strike also. So you can imagine all those strikes within a span of one and a half years and all those strikes affecting you. So our academic calendar has been greatly affected and we are behind schedule. We were supposed to graduate next year, but currently we are still in fourth year. Normally Kenya has six years for medical school, unlike here. So we are still in fourth year and we normally come for the electives at the end of fifth year. So even coming here was an uncertainty for us, but we are happy that we've made it here. The people here have been so friendly to us. We've learned a lot from you guys both in the hospital and socially. We don't have as much computers as you guys do here. We don't have as many cars as you guys here. Not many people work here, but in Kenya, it's the opposite. Socially, we've gotten to interact with many people in dinners and cookouts. We've learned new foods. Personally, I like nachos. Everyone has something they like. <laughs> yeah, and we've gotten to learn a few games like cornhole and all in all, I'd like to appreciate uh, the interaction between AMPATH, uh, bringing Kenya and the U.S. together. It's a good thing. And I'd like to end, to end my story by saying Asante Sana. And my journey is now ending. Uh, I started as being a patient and wanting to take care of people. And now my journey is ending as me taking care of the people. So Asante Sana, that means thank you in Swahili. Asante sana to you, Janet. What an amazing story. I couldn't survive one day of medical school, much less four, five, six years. This next storyteller is a special friend of mine. Craig Brader served as the ninth dean of the IU School of Medicine from 2000 to 2013, and prior to that, chaired the Department of Medicine as the AMPATH partnership was being formed. He was there from the very beginning. He has introduced hundreds of students, faculty, and supporters to AMPATH, and continues to provide volunteer leadership for the IU Center for Global Health and organizations all across the global health community. His story is called Unanticipated Impact and Rewards. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Craig Brater. She blames me for getting her involved. Um, so um, thank you, I think, for the opportunity to do this. Um, Unlike Janet, uh, I have had the opportunity to speak to a lot of Mazungas, um, but I don't recall being quite as uptight about it uh, as I am right now, as a matter of fact. It's a very different kind of, uh, of discussion. So um, I will relieve you. I'm not going to talk about me. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, our family more broadly. <clears throat> and I hope I don't cry. So let me, the theme of this is that, you know, those of us in particular who are medical or in the health professions, when we go to Kenya, we just dive in and we get involved in the wards and all this other stuff. And, you know, it's very easy for us to just hit the ground running. I mean, we don't know what we're doing most of the time, at least in the early going, but it's, it's really easy. But many of us take family members. And so I want to talk to you about some of the benefits 
that are unanticipated that come from some of those experiences. And I have four little vignettes, unless Bob tells me my time's up, but I usually ignore him, so I will continue to do so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, the first time, and actually I'm going to describe stuff that came from pre-Ampath, because Ampath really started when we really got into the HIV business. Uh, and I'm going to tell you stuff that's derivative from our first visits that were first in 85, second in 87, and third in, in 89. And um, those times, uh, Stephanie and I, and remember Stephanie, we're going to circle back to that in a, minute, in a little bit, who's my wife and our daughter, Amy, uh, all went together to Kenya during those trips. And sometimes with a few relatives that we were dragging along. Um, and the first time we went in 85, our daughter was 14. And we went during the summer, of course, because that's the only time she could go. And she was really pissed. So for those of you who don't know, I did a lot of work with diuretics, so that's a technical term that I just used. Um, but um, <clears throat> so if, if, she, if we'd been at home, she would have been taking driver's education like all of her classmates. But instead, we're dragging her across the world. And in those days, you drove from Nairobi up to Eldoret on terrible roads. It took hours. And you had a pit stop in the Kuru uh, at a, a good restroom, which was pretty pitiful. And um, she went from being mad at us for depriving her of her summer at home to wondering if she was ever going to get home alive. <laughs> and in those days, um, Sarah Ellen had developed a relationship with Testimony School. And many of you may know that. For those of you who don't, it's a, it's a big school there that's kind of right up the hill from the current IU house. And actually, in those days, the IU house was a single house, and uh, it was just across the street, basically, from Testimony School. So that's where we were staying. But Sarah Ellen had developed this relationship, and so a lot of the uh, accompanying family members would go over there and volunteer in the school. And it was a big school, and they'd just go and just do whatever was needed, and, and it was also connected to a thing called Jacaranda Cottage, which was across the street, which was an orphanage that they sponsored. And it was run by uh, two people named Joshua and Miriam. So also remember those names, okay? Joshua and Miriam. So um, we got there, and I go to the wards, and uh, Stephanie and Amy go up to the school to volunteer, and they put their arms around them and get them involved. And... Um, and this was a real turning point for our daughter. She got, you know, really immersed in this, got real excited about it. She found that she had the opportunity to boss her mother around. <clears throat> and she was actually uh, developing these, you know, these programs, and Stephanie was working for her in that. Uh, and, the, <clears throat> and what happened, one result of that was uh, we went again in 87, <clears throat> and then we weren't sure when we were going to go again. And our daughter came to us, I guess, in late 80, 88 or early 89 and said, you know, uh, when are we going to go to Kenya again? Because I'm going to be going off to college soon, and I know after that it'll be hard to, to visit there. We said, well, we don't really have any, any plans, any firm plans. And she said, well, you know, <coughs> if this was the best of all possible worlds, I would uh, take about a, we'd go and I'd take about a dozen of my friends so they could get their priorities straight. And we said, we're going, and we went in 89, okay? Next little vignette is uh, we took my mother when she was 78. My dad had died about a year before, and she was really hesitant about going, and we convinced her to go. And <coughs> the, the notion was that she'd be able to see this, uh, not only through her own eyes, but through his eyes. And uh, she just loved it. She got all involved, and I won't tell you all the details, but we got back, and she said, you know, <coughs> this changed my life. And I'm kind of a smart ass. So I said, well, Mom, if I'd known that was going to happen, I would have taken you 40 years ago. <clears throat> now, I thought this was hilarious. Her, her not so much. Um, so now, roll forward, and our daughter, who's now... She's now 38, 
So in her early 30s, I don't remember the uh, exact uh, timing. She finally has a chance to go back with us. We've been several times before uh, in, that, in that interim. And as so often occurs in Kenya, when you're going to show up there, the word gets out, and there's this whole flood of people who, come, who show up. So we're there, and uh, a lot of these kids that Amy and Stephanie interacted with wanted to see Amy. Uh, and these were kids who had had learning disabilities, because our daughter had a learning disability. And she recognized that a lot of the kids in these classrooms that she was volunteering in also had learning disabilities. And they were branded as stupid and, you know, it was terrible. So their self-esteem was in the toilet. And so <coughs> the coursework that our daughter developed that Stephanie helped with was actually to take them out of those classrooms and have, put, have a bunch of individual tutoring and really help them in terms of their learning and their self-esteem. So now roll forward to now, instead of being 14 or 16 years old, she's in her 30s and she's there. And one of these kids comes up to her, who had been one of the orphans at Jacaranda Cottage. He'd had a horrible, uh, tragic early life, had a learning disability. But now he was an adult, young adult, he was employed, he had a good job, he had a, a, a wife and a family. And he went to Amy. <coughs> Pardon me. And he said, if it weren't for you, I would not know how to read. And I would have never accomplished anything. And Lord knows what would have happened to me. So she had given him his future. Can you imagine that, how rewarding that felt? Lastly, uh, last year we were back in Kenya and we went to visit um, Miriam and Joshua, who had now, they were gone not at this Jack Around a College cottage, you may know that they started an orphanage for specifically for HIV positive kids. What big hearts, my God, to do that in a, in a, a huge need. So we hadn't seen them in probably four or five years and we went to visit and had a delightful afternoon spending with them. And then we're getting ready to go and uh, as we're leaving, uh, Miriam says, you remember our son Mark? And Mark was a young man who really had a quite a few struggles as he was growing up. And he had a daughter, and, um, and we knew that. We didn't really know what much had happened to Mark. And as we're leaving, uh, this little girl comes running up. And you know how shy Kenyans are, and so she's sitting there, you know, and she doesn't know what to do. And um, Miriam says, we named her Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie. For her. Thank you. Do you see why we love that guy and why we miss him so much? Thank you, Craig. Our next storyteller is Michael Musili. He's also a fourth year medical student at Moy University, and he's visiting IU now. His story is titled, The Light. Please welcome Michael Musili. Hello. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you so much. Baby, hello, how are you? Uh, I am so excited to stand before all of you this evening. Yeah, you know, uh, in Kenya, when a speaker, when a preacher, to be specific, stands in front of a crowd like this, he would always ask them to shout amen after every point that he puts across. <laughs> well, that is meant to keep him encouraged, to keep him talking. Well, I won't, I won't ask you to do that uh, today, but I will ask you to laugh. Just laugh. I mean, even if you don't hear what I'm talking about, even if you don't understand my, my accent, you know, just laugh. It will keep me talking for the next seven minutes that I am going to be here. Yeah. Um, uh, my story, as you've heard, it's titled The Light. And The Light in Kiswahili 
in Swahili, which is the language that we speak mostly in Kenya, means uh, Mwangaza. Back in Kenya, Mwangaza is a foundation, a scholarship foundation, which was uh, started back in the year 2000. It sponsors students who are doing medicine at Mo University and those who come from needy backgrounds. It was started by Haley, Haley uh, Dustin. She comes from Indiana, Indianapolis to be specific, to the north. I know most of you, okay, maybe some of you know her. Personally, I don't know her. And I, I look, and as I look forward to meeting her tomorrow at 3.30, I can't wait to tell her how she brought light to my life, how she made me see the light in the darkness. My story, as you've heard, it's about light. I come from a very big family, a family of 10, 10 siblings. I am the last born in this family. It's such a big family. In fact, some of the cousins don't know each other. In fact, I have some grandchildren. <laughs> I know most of you don't understand that. I, I have some grandchildren in the sense that uh, my nieces and nephews, some of them have kids. So they call me grandfather. <laughs> the other day, they were calling me while I was here. They called me the other day and they were telling me, you know, uh, grandfather, bring us something from U.S. And I was thinking, hey, do you know how life is expensive here? Because <laughs> I, I remember there was this day I went uh, to the barber shop to have my hair cut. You know, I had to part with $25. A whole $25. That is 2,500 Kenya shillings. That is amount of money which can sustain me for a whole, almost a whole month, let me say three weeks. And I gave this, uh, this man, you know, and you know, it was even very funny because he, he we, we, I bargained, okay, we, he was doing the hair, so I asked him like, okay, so how much does it, this cost? And he said $20, okay, fine. Um, so he started doing the hair and I was like, ah, $20, it's too much. So he started, you know, cutting my hair. Then at some point, uh, he finished the head. Then I'm like, what about this? What about the beards? And he was like, you, that is four extra dollars. I mean, five extra dollars. And I was like, ah, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to pay five extra dollars to have the, this one's cut for me to look presentable before you today. Actually, <laughs> actually, yeah, if it, if it were not for this day, honestly, I would have, had my hair cut. <laughs> it's too expensive, man. Yeah, so I, I told these nieces and nephews of mine that life here is very expensive. Anyway, if I get something, something, I'll bring you. Then I was walking down the streets and I found this uh, uh, Indiana shop which was selling some souvenirs, you know, those bands written in Indianapolis and stuff. I think that's what I will carry for this one dollar or two. <laughs> well, let me continue with my story. So I am the last one in this family of a very big family. And I actually don't encourage family planning because if my father and mother did family planning, I wouldn't have been born. In fact, <laughs> and that means there won't be a doctor in our family, you know, being the last one and the only one in medical school. Anyway, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> So uh, I was the first one in our family to gain education. My other nine siblings didn't make it to go to school. Well, they went for the primary level, but then they, there was issues with school fees. So they didn't proceed beyond the primary level. I was the first one. I was the lucky one. When I finished primary level, some well-wishers uh, offered to sponsor me uh, to pay for my secondary school fee. And that's how I got to secondary school, to high school. But it was not high because it, was, it wasn't high because it was a remote day school, uh, very remote. You know, those village schools where we used to go to school and, you know, walk back to school. It was close to the village. It, it was close to my village, but it was not close to my home. So I would walk for several kilometers to 
and from school every single day. And you know, it was very hectic because when I get to, like when I come back home, I'm very tired. So I just want to sleep. Sometimes, some other times, uh, there is no paraffin. You know, we use paraffin in where I come from. There is no electricity. So sometimes we run out of paraffin and I have to, to sleep that, that night early so that the following day I wake up early to go and read from school because the school used to have electricity. It was that bad. But all the same, I worked hard, very hard. And I, I remember sometimes I could be sent from school. I mean, I could be sent home from school to go and uh, bring money. When, especially when the well wisher delayed in paying the money. And I could stay home for several days. And by the time, by the time I'm getting back to school, half of the syllabus is already cleared and I'm very confused, you know, all sorts of things. But I never lost my determination. I was very determined. So I still worked hard. The little time that I used to have, I could get focused, use it maximally. And I remember when the final exam came, when I was sitting for my final year, uh, in, in secondary school, I passed really well and got admitted to med medical school in more University. The story didn't, doesn't end there. When I got to medical school, it was, you know, I was excited like everyone is, you know, becoming a doctor. Where we come from, becoming a doctor is like the next to God. I mean, after God, I think we have doctor, then those other things. Everyone dreams of becoming a doctor. It's different from here where... Uh, all profession are, are like the same. I, I saw there is no that supremacy between one profession and another. In Kenya, it's different. Every child wants to be a doctor out there. So when I found myself in medical school, I was very excited for the first few days. Then on the third day, I was excited day one and day two. Then day three, I was like, wow, okay, so I'm in medical school. Where am I going to get my school fee from? Then it started hitting me again. By that time, those well wishers had already dropped me, so now I was to sort myself out. So I was very confused. I didn't know what to do. And I remembered at some point I was contemplating, should I drop medicine and go and pursue another course? Because in medical school, we stay, from, we stay in school from January to December. Are you getting me? I'm a, all my <laughs> English is different. Well, I hope you're understanding me. So we stay from... We stay from school, I mean, we stay in school from January to December. No long holidays. Other courses do have long holidays. Like you find, you study for six months, then the other six months you are out of school, so you go do some job somewhere. So I wanted to go and do that. I mean, to leave medical school and go pursue another course, so I will have enough time to do, I mean, so we study for six months, then for the rest of six months, I'm out there working to get money to pay for the subsequent year. You are getting me. Well, but then I remember the reason why I wanted to be a doctor. Because I, I remember at some point in time, my mother was very sick. She was diagnosed with TB and she was there sleeping, uh, hopeless, and I was there helpless. I didn't know what to do. It really hurt me and I was like, no. If I was a doctor, probably I would have treated her myself. Or else I would have taken her to an hospital where she would have gotten good care. So that really motivated me and I said, I purposed that I am going to study hard to become a doctor. So when I was contemplating between leaving medical school and going to pursue a different course, now the thought of becoming a doctor and the motivation that I had came. And I was like, no. It was now during this time, this uh, state of confusion, of dilemma, while I was in darkness, not knowing what to do, it's when I heard about Mangaza. Mangaza, I applied for this uh, scholarship and I, uh, I got it for the last four or five years that I've been in school. Mangaza has been paying my school fee. I am very, very grateful to this organization, to Mrs. Ellie and every other donor who are putting money towards this uh, program. You have, you have helped us see the light where there was darkness. You have helped us uh, uh, move and you have put us in a situation where we are able to reach to our dreams. I said dream of becoming a surgeon. I said dream of becoming a doctor. I said dream of uh, uh, becoming a doctor and helping people out there. This is cause, mainly because of the 
of this scholarship uh, that I got from Ampath. It is part of Ampath. I am so uh, grateful for that. Uh, you know, I will end my story by saying, Africa needs the light. Africa needs this light. Kenya needs this light. And every family in my community needs to see this light. It is this light that will bring change in our nation. It is this light that will bring change in our continent. It is this light that will bring change to the whole world. Whatever that you can do to bring light in someone's life, do it. I will end finally by quote, this is my quote, that those in the light reflect the light for those in darkness to see the light. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, bringer of light. And I think if the medical school thing doesn't work out for you, maybe you could become a preacher <laughs> or a politician. I'd vote for you. I'd vote for you. Well, I am one of the thousands of people that Craig and Stephanie Brater brought into the AMPATH program. Just in case there's somebody in this room who does not know what AMPATH stands for, the word, the, the letters stand for Academic Model Providing Access to Healthcare. And the last I heard from Dr. Joe Mamlin, there are four million, four million Kenyans who now have access to comprehensive medical treatment and healthcare because of the work that Indiana University and Moy University are doing in Western Kenya. Yes, there are other universities in the consortium, of course there are, but Indiana University is carrying the lion's share of the load. I was a faculty member at IU Bloomington for 10 years at one of their more prestigious schools, the music school, but I can tell you that I believe with my whole heart the best work, the best work that Indiana University is doing is the IU Kenya partnership, medical partnership. <laughs> so you might rightly ask, well, Sylvia, what does somebody like you do when you go to Kenya? I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse. I'm not a physical therapist or a pharmacist. I have no medical skills at all. So I do things like organize the Stephanie Brater Library at the Children's Center in the hospital. I do things like hang out at NEMA School, which is the school and the orphanage that Craig was talking about, run by Miriam and... Joshua Mbithi. In fact, I've adopted a little girl who's living at that school, and I'm very proud to support her. Her name is Anastasia, and she is gorgeous. She's so beautiful. I do things like organize, produce, and perform in a concert. In fact, the last time I was there, it was a concert in the Chandaria Chronic Disease Center. Sort of the, the building was just opening, really. And I decided to call these concerts a concert for peace. And I know how Janet feels about talking in front of a lot of mzungus, because when I sing concerts in Eldoret, I have to sing in front of a lot of Kenyans. And I'm even so brazen as to sing in Swahili in front of a lot of Kenyans. So I'm going to close, I'm going to close this, this evening's storytelling by singing a song that I learned on one of my very first visits, I believe, to Kenya, thanks to Wycliffe, 
who was my Swahili teacher. Oh, you've taken Swahili lessons with Wycliffe, I see. This song is a wonderful song. It was written by a wonderful Kenyan musician by the name of Eric Wainaina, who actually studied music at the Berklee School of Music in Boston. This song sort of became Kenya's unofficial national anthem in 2007, after the election violence which took over the country. And it's a beautiful song that talks about the four colors in the Kenyan flag. Black for the color of our skin, red for the blood that we have shed for freedom, green for the earth which sustains us, and white for peace. Umoja ni fahari etu, undugu ndi ongugu. Chukina ukabila, hatutaki hatatamwe. Lazima tungane, tuijenge inchi yetu. Pasiwe hatamoja, anaetenga nisha. Naishi, natumaini, najitolea daima Kenya. Hakika ya bendera, ni udhabiri wangu. Nyeusi ya wana inchina, nyekundu ni adamu. Kichani ni ardhi, nyeupe ya amani. Daima mimi Kenya, mwana inchi mzalendo. Michael, in, uh, perhaps in Kenya, doctors are up here, but here at Indiana University and in uh, the state of Indiana, doctors are here and vocalists are here. <laughs> Sarabi talked about uh, the importance of showing up, and there are two people, uh, Megan Miller and Deb Neary, who show up every day at my office and do a wonderful job, and they're the ones responsible for having put this on uh, this evening. So many thanks uh, to you. And uh, for the storytellers uh, for this evening uh, who showed up, it takes a lot of courage to do it. Obviously, it takes a lot of heart and a lot of passion. And I am deeply uh, grateful to you for uh, your willingness uh, to have uh, stood here and shared your story uh, with all of us. Thank you very much. And lastly, uh, to all of you, who showed up today and made that leap of faith and joined with us as we uh, join with our Kenyan, our Kenyan colleagues. Thank you so much for being here and I look forward 
to seeing you again next year. Have a nice evening. <laughs>